our heads together and to be able to um, look at some possible options and solutions as well. So just quickly, just tell you a little bit about, uh, before we go ahead, I'd like to start with this appreciation I do every time uh, to thank the governor, uh, Lagos State Governor, our governor, well, for the amazing sacrifice and courage. Please turn off your video and turn off your, mute your mic, please, if you're joining us. It will be easier for all of us as well. Um, and also I want to thank the Federal Government Minister of Health uh, for all the hard work they're doing. We can criticize them for what they're not doing, but it's good to say thank you for what they're doing as well. So that's where we normally start this uh, each session, just a sense of appreciation for those who are doing something. Because um, it's easier to criticize. It's not easy to do. So uh, it may not be perfect, but we're grateful for what they're doing. And we hope that they will do more. Um, also, just a bit about Conrad Clark, just over 10 years, different platforms. Um, we're passionate about risk in every aspect of life, not just only in one area, but all aspects of life. We, we've been engaging the medical and clinical professionals in the last few days. Also, engaging education, you know, the, the energy resources, financial services. These are some of the things we do. Um, and so we exist to assure performance outcomes in an environment of uncertainties. So when, when we have uncertain um, factors, that's what we exist to do. Just also, just look at our objective for today in terms of all our conversation. We have to think protection and survival of humans. We are at the very critical stage where human beings to be protected. Then after that, perhaps re reinvigoration or restoration of the economy and businesses. That's going to be the next thing because very, very soon, the conversation will move from protection of human beings to what's going to happen to people, economy, jobs, losses, and crime, social factors will, will come into play uh, in another few weeks. And that will be the reality we'll be discussing. Most countries are going to recession or potential avoiding recession. So what are we going to do? And this sector, insurance, is there to protect, as you all know. Also, I just want to highlight, for most of you are not familiar with uh, our Nigerian Risk Awards, um, please mute your mic, please. If you're joining us, I'll be saying it over and over again. Please mute your mic. It will help us. It will pick the background uh, noise in your where you are. Um, so just say, although I think there's a possibility that we're going to postpone uh, this uh, celebration to somewhere later, because as you all know what's happening globally. I want to encourage for those of us in insurance an opportunity to enter for this award this year, especially with this COVID-19 and to see how you're responding, what you've done. We want to be able to celebrate you. And uh, this category is particularly sponsored by Continental. We thank them for all their support. So please, please, please tell your colleagues, tell your uh, colleagues to go on www.nigerianriskawards.com. And there is also the risk manager of the year, one individual we celebrate every two years. We sponsor them to a conference in the US. And also and this year, uh, please can you mute your yeah. mic, please? Please you. mute your mic. Thank you. Can you mute your mic, please? Thank you. And also there'll be um, something we're looking for the young risk manager of the year. Somebody between 20, 28 who's been doing a fantastic job. Uh, this is sponsored by the UK Institute of Risk Management. A special treat for this particular individual. So please go to Nigerian Risk Award and just enter. So today, Again, I've, I've, I'm going to just go over the rules again. Please, all mics on mute and video off while the webinar is on. A uh, question will be noted in the chat room. So we have a chat room. You can raise your hands. Uh, you can ask questions. We'll pick you, but just so that we can do this in a very, very orderly fashion and we all enjoy it. Workshop recording will be shared later. If you're interested, let us know. We'll be happy to share. So we have a lineup of fantastic speakers today. 
And we're going to start with uh, Mrs. Raka Adebola, who is the group head claims and reinsurance Axum and Sat. Um, and uh, she happens to be our first, uh, the first person that won the Nigerian Risk Award Risk Manager of the Year a few years ago. And she's been thriving since then. And um, I, I believe she's around. And we will be taking a talk then, followed by Yvonne Pam, who is uh, the Director of Risk Management and Compliance and Actual Service African Reassurance. She'll be bringing an amazing perspective to us also. And then finally, Bola Oyinide will be looking at the implications from a reinsurance as well. So these are my uh, key speakers and facilitators this afternoon. I'll be coming back later to also round up and take all your questions. So thank you. As uh, just enjoy. If you have a question, I'm sure there'll be lots of people with lots of questions. We'll take your, we'll take as many as possible. If we cannot finish it within this period, we'll carry the conversation somewhere online. Yeah. Thank you. I guess Bola. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Mr. Joachim. Um, um, like you said, I'm Adibola Surakat. Um, I'll be taking you, uh, we'll basically be having a discussion on um, the implication of COVID-19 on the insurance industry in Africa. But before I start, I'd like to say that I hope that we are all um, keeping safe and we're observing all of the precautionary measures, uh, you know, um, in, we, are, we are getting informed about by the NCDC and the Ministry of Health from time to time. It's very imperative that we do this to try to flatten the curve and ensure that our uh, issues don't skyrocket beyond how it should be. We are seeing things that are happening in other countries and it would be great if Nigeria can actually, you know, manage the issues and ensure that we don't, our issues don't escalate beyond um, the normal. Um, um, the implication of COVID-19 on the insurance industry, I'll do a bit of an introduction. Um, I'll do a bit of an introduction uh, on the response of the insurance. Um, I'll also talk about broad implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll look at the possible implications on the non-life, which is where I'll do a little bit more, and um, possible opportunities as well from this um, pandemic. Um, as we all know, uh, there's so much information about um, COVID-19 out there, and um, um, there's so much that people are talking about. There's a lot of facts, there's a lot of myths, you know, but we should be able to know which ones are the facts and which ones are the myths. However, I won't dwell on what COVID-19 is because I believe there's a lot of information out there already. However, um, it's a pandemic situation and the every industry, every individual, the government, everybody has had to respond to this particular pandemic in one way or the other. In terms of the insurance industries, we, insur insurance industry or as underwriters, we had to respond as both as employers and, you know, as underwriters, as claim payers and, you know, many other things. As, as employers, I think what was very important, important for a lot of insurance uh, companies was, first of all, the health and safety of their employees and how we're going to try to also work towards ensuring that we could ob observe all of the precautionary measures, the social distancing, the um, hygiene, hygiene requirements and all of that. And so the next thing for a lot of companies was quickly to see how they could start the remote working to ensure that um, this doesn't um, that then the um, employees don't have to come to work. Um, this, of course, had to be a function of you having some level of a business continuity plan, or, you know, or um, a, a, a crisis management plan. And so we've seen that insurance companies have had to evoke this, either their BCPs or their CMPs, to actually be able to continue operations with minimal disruptions to their services. Also, we had seen that employers had to also do a lot of communication to employees on how the business continuity plan would work out, you know, how they expect the employees to conduct themselves at this time, just to ensure that they are safe and that all precautionary measures are also 
being carried along. And the continuous updates from the employee, uh, from the um, insurance companies to their employees on the incident, how it's faring out. Also, some, some insurance companies are also trying to also assist the government. We've seen communications around different insurance companies on how they want to provide some sort of support to the doctors in terms of life insurance, some form of insurance to um, you know, back up the work that they are doing. Um, it's interesting that um, we, we, we've had, uh, we have doctors who are willing, we've had also people who have volunteered to actually help in the treatment of COVID-19 in the different um, 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 hospitals and um, infectious disease um, um, sites. Um, also, um, insurance companies also had to look out for cybersecurity controls. These are risks that may occur from the <laughs> and So they had to continue to look at yeah, so their true. employees on how this would um, this would pan out, and so everybody's mm. looking at what are the risks of my team working in their different um, locations, locations. To connecting to um, the um, the, um, the, um, the servers and all that. So that's another yes. area that insurance had to, you know, um, from... respond to. In terms of underwriting and claims. Um, we would see that um, clearly as, um, on, um, as underwriters, we had to look for how we are going to connect with our customers, what are the available digital capabilities that we have, and how are we going to engage with our clients at this time. Immediately, um, we also needed to look at what would be the impact of this on the claims, on claims costs, what would be the impact of this pandemic on claims, claims costs. And basically, this is really as a function of the class of business that we are looking at, and also some of the policy wordings that we have and how we will protect ourselves in this time. Also, um, it was important for us to quickly start responding in terms of looking at what are the new procedures for interactions with doing the claims and the underwriting processes with the customers. What are the ways we can also improve our service de delivery? What are the exceptional workarounds that we can put in place to ensure that we ensure that our customers are satisfied at this time and we're still able to deliver a very good level of service. Uh, prospects for growth and profitability in insurance, underwriting and investment portfolios is also a major consideration. How is this um, impact going to affect the books, both on the underwriting side and also from the investment side? Um, and of course, more importantly, we also needed to ensure that we keep communicating with our customers and ensure that we keep them in the loop of all of the developments around our business with regards to COVID-19. We can also quickly take a look at the general implications for this. Um, you know, so this pandemic has is affecting everybody in the world. It's not, it's 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 really like a worldwide wide situation which is why it's a pandemic situation and it's not something that um we can say that we we can actually really prepare for it's possible to prepare for it but there will be trends that you know you would not foresee but however we're looking at it generally with what we have seen so far this may evolve for different um, um, um countries within africa and outside africa as the time goes but from what we see there is already a decline in economic activity, um, you know, which translates generally to decreasing premiums for insurance. So we have seen that already. We are even we have the issue of the oil as one issue, and then we still have the pandemic itself, you know. So we have like a double warming on the on the Nigerian side here. So we've seen the um, the decrease in oil, 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 or the, the price of oil to. Um, around um, less than $30, $30 per barrel. And so um, this already has affected our reserves as, an, as, as a country, as well as the impacts of the pandemic, the shutdown in economic activities and all that. We will also see slower growth definitely in profitability and profitability for underwriting and investment portfolios. Um, we would we would we would be able to ascertain as insurance companies if truly we're operational and technology prepared for this. So we'll be able to test 
our, our, our the effectiveness of our business continuity plans to be able to test the effectiveness of our critical management plans and also test you know our remote working capabilities as as organizations um also um this particular situation i believe would also test the relevance of insurance because we would find that because of the way our policy uh, policies are worded um, a lot of the policies have some exclusions for situations such as pandemics and epidemics and so and so of infectious diseases and co communicable diseases there are exclusions that we have in some of our policies and so the relevance of insurance would be deliberated by a lot of policy holders to say that you know are we truly going are we truly um relevant at this time and also in some situations you will find that also insurance will be it will be a lifesaver for some other insurance companies so it would be it would it would be a discussion of you know different you know depending on how it plays out for different entities that discussion will definitely come out also, the continued lack of transparency and trust, which has been an underlying issue for the trust sector, maybe as I said, especially with that to my last point, in situations where, in situations where, um, where we are not able to take on the claim because of maybe likely exclusions in the policy, you know, it's something that will also come up. Also, it would be there will be financial implications for entities including insurance companies there will be possible adjustments of budgets there will be possible adjustments of implementation plans and cash flow expectations etc um, also the volatility and falling interest rates could imp impact generally our earnings perspective for the year and you know it that is important and it, it, it even though it, it even has a greater impact on, on the life aspect of, of the business of course as 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 we recover um, from 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 this uh, pandemic, we would see that it would have an effect on all of all of our customers, entities that we do business with, and this may also delay premiums. And you know, there might be some insolvencies here and there, which may further add pressure to the situation that we may face. And then, more importantly, into our business the increase in claim, possible increase in claim frequency and or severity from different portfolios or certain portfolios. I'm focusing on non-life, so I, I, I highlighted the business interruption policies, fire, liability, event cancellation and travel, etc. Um, so these are the areas where I feel that as an insurance company, we would have a bit more um, queries, questions, claims, frequencies, severities, and so on. Um, I believe that um, um, the, the, the generally, like I said before, pandemics, epidemics, they are generally excluded from many business insurance um, policies. And so the early prognosis for a lot of, of, of entities was that oh, the claims levels will be low as a result of this um, COVID. But um, because these losses may come in different forms or different ways, and it's still, is still based on how the policies are worded, you know, how the terms and conditions are, and you know, you know. So that for me, there's no hard and fast rule to how it is that we believe that the implications may truly be. But what is important is that we even know or we are able to identify the areas where we feel that okay, there are likelihoods that there might be claims or you know from these areas. So which is what I have tried to do just to try to highlight the different areas that I feel that we may be experiencing some level of higher claims or possible lower premiums, et cetera. You know, so for me, I believe that because of the shutdown period, no matter how short it is, we may have some reduction in mortal claims frequency, you know, um, due to the CMO at all measures. We're currently in our second week, about to end the second week, you know, there are indications here and there, even though it's not confirmed that there will be extensions. Um, if we look at the first um, country that suffered, uh, that started the pandemic, that started the COVID-19, they actually were um, in, on the shutdown for 11 weeks before they, they picked up again. So uh, we know we might not get to 11 weeks, but we know that it might be for longer than we have currently stayed quarantine at home now. So we um, believe that that might happen. Also, um, Okay, also, um, in terms of fire and householder policies, 
just we may expect to see some increase in frequency we just believe that people are home there's increased usage of electrical appliances there's extended alternative power usage generator and all of that and normally we know that this, all of this uh, with regards to some of the quality of the electricity that we get from time to time there may be power surges and things like that and so we might have some fire claims. Uh, we also feel that there might be frequency in the employer benefit policy such as WC, which covers some level of um, disease in the course of work. And we just feel that a few employees, their role or their jobs are, are closely related to, you know, the, the COVID-19, maybe testing or you know, uh, first responders or laboratory workers, you know, there's a possibility that there may be some, some frequency there. In terms of our GPA and travel policies as well, there might be covered cost, uh, cover of costs for repatriation of stranded individuals, cancel trips and things like that. I mean, like I said, as, a, as an introduction, depending on how the policies are worded, these are just areas for us to look out for. Um, aviation, on the other hand, is likely to see reduced premium uh, because we believe that airlines are grounded. Um, I think I was watching the news yesterday and the um, CEO of um, Aero Contractors had said that that the um, the um, the loss is already nearing about four hundred million dollars, you know, in um, you know, because of the of the fact that these airlines are, are grounded, you know, globally. So there is um, a lot that is going to happen, you know. But we you know we are just looking at it and saying these are the early early points for us to even start looking at before we then see how the trends go, and then we can then you know start to pinpoint exactly how things will go. Business interruption policies is an, is a major area where there's quite a lot of discussions around it, and uh, but I think that this basically still also depends on how the policy is worded. Um, there, 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 there's always that um, clause of um, physical. Um, that for there to be a physical damage also before any a business interruption policy can can be um, can be evoked. But however, also there are some people who are trying to you know link you know what the physical loss or physical damage it relates in as it could be related to the COVID nineteen. So you know those are those are some of the areas, and then we also looked at the marine cargo policies and say that it's possible that they also in that policy you know there can be some delays at the ports and things like that due to this shutdown and you know what are the implications for 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 the people who who who, who the customers or the insurers who are carrying the goods especially if the goods are perishable so those are the areas that we have looked at in the non-life i believe my colleagues will talk a bit more about all the other areas but um, these are the areas that i felt that you know these are the areas where we should be looking at and try to see the trends that may fall from these areas and then we can begin to identify you know how things would eventually play out but lastly i just thought to talk a bit, a bit about opportunities uh, because with every situation you would find that with every risk situation or every issue like crisis you will find that there may be likely opportunities for us as insurance companies at all as well um, i think the first thing is for us to also be ready to strive for more transparency and disclosures in communication to, uh, to instead the trust and confidence in, our, in, our ins in insurance. So for customers who probably eventually will find that, that their policies are not as tight as they expected or the policy would, they will not cover them for the areas of the business that we you know, that we also strive to ensure that we be more transparent and dis we disclose this um, early on to customers so it doesn't come to them as a rude shock. Um, also, we believe that there will be huge demand for comprehensive business insurance, especially, especially with um, business interruption, where we believe that you know people will then seek to get to pay for additional for to include um, to include um, um, riders to cover exclusions such as pandemic and um, other things like um, event cancellations and all of that, because of the huge losses that people would you know, goes through at the end of this whole COVID-19. And also we, we need to continue to invest as insurance companies in more innovative products and services to be relevant, continue to be relevant to our customers. At times like this, are there 
you know, other kinds of insurance policies that we can put together that people can actually benefit from. There's a lot of people who cannot even, you know, feed themselves because what they earn, their earnings are daily earnings. And so when the, comp the federal government says, oh, there's going to be a shutdown, they definitely cannot cope at this point in time. You know, are there policies that we need to start to think about to actually help people at this time to be able to maintain this? I think the whole COVID-19 opportunities, it helps us to begin to think a bit more, you know, about digital transformation. We have not really in the bandwagon as much as we would expect in terms of digital transformation, but clearly the situation came and the opportunity arose and we all are at least to a large extent, every company is engaging in some level of remote working, which means that we are beginning to get the you know, how we to talk to our customers, digital lots around these areas, but there's much more to do. We need to, this, this situation is going to you know, bring forth that acceleration that we need to actually start to talk to the right technology enablers that can help us move this forward. Um, I think that will be all from my side. Um, I, I'm sure that the other two speakers also have very interesting perspectives around this issue and they they will be able to bring a lot more insights to what it is that um, we're facing as an insurance as insurance companies. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for listening, and um, I'll wait to see if I can address some of the questions as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adebola Suraka. That's amazing. I'm particularly quite an interesting perspective and looking at some of the implications. As we know, risk has two dimensions, threats and opportunities. We're able to look at the threats while also exploring the opportunities. One thing also I'm going to say is that crisis actually is an interesting time. Crisis, it's a kind of a shift in equilibrium. It moves everything from the way we used to do things and redefines the way, what we know. So there'll be lots of new things that will come out of this crisis, even though there are other sad part of it. Um, but the, the thing is, this crisis will either come to it will validate lots and lots of expertise or expose a lot of incompetencies. That's what I think we're going to see more and more. Um, and that will lead us to nicely to the next session. We will take all the questions. I think maybe what we'll do, we'll take the questions at the end. If you don't want to forget your question, please write it in the chat room so that we can I can take it. But I want to flow through all the all the conversations, then we'll take questions at the end. Uh, the next speaker, Yvonne, will be exploring the potential risk implications for the insurance industry generally. Um, and his perspective is very interesting because being an actuary, uh, the, the, uh, the, the looking at the angle, which we're interested to see how she's going to bring us. So I'm just going to invite Yvonne to share a thought with us. And again, we'll get or we'll pick all the questions later um, after the third speaker. Yvonne, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everybody for listening. Um, as you mentioned, I'll be going through the potential risk impacts for the insurance industry and looking more from a yeah, risk management perspective as well. Um, so if we can just go to the next slide, please. So COVID-19, it's not just COVID-19 that we should be thinking about. Um, it's also the associated economic impacts and um, especially aggravated with the oil price slump. Um, so insurers should have a good think about the external risk factors that can affect them um, and not just internal. So in this slide, um, it gives you a sample pestle analysis which indicates some of the risk factors that could be faced by African insurers. So this is just an example of some um, um, horizon, uh, horizon scanning that an insurance company can be doing to see what would impact them um, from an external perspective. This by no means is um, uh, uh, exhaustive. So just going through this pestle analysis, we should think about the political implica implications. Um, yeah, okay. There's government intervention and coverage disputes that can happen. There's the lockdown. You know, we're locked down only for two weeks in Lagos currently, but this could be two months. It could be four months. We don't know. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. And we should also think about things like 
um, slower reaction times from governments with other issues that could be something that comes up. Um, in terms of economic factors, there's the global and national recession, the potential for global and national recession and the associate fallout. We've had quite a few sovereign downgrades in recent in the recent in recent weeks, um, even in Nigeria, and that can lead to downgrades of banks. It um, could lead to rising and distressed debt and foreign exchange issues, uh, particularly in oil producing countries. And um, we've already seen that quite a few uh, exchange rates around Africa have been slipping um, against the dollar. So this is something to consider. In terms of social aspects, we should think about unemployment rates that are increasing. We have a lot of um, informal sectors around Africa, things like the, the type of healthcare infrastructure you have in your countries and um, the added pressure that's going to have on that, that COVID-19 is going to have on that. In terms of technological, we've talked of a few things. There's internet connection challenges, there's power or the lack thereof, and increased cyber attacks, which I'll talk about a bit more later on, and environmental impact implications as well. There's medical waste pollution that could be increasing. All these face masks that people have been buying uh, got, have to go somewhere. And um, But on the plus side, there could be some positive environmental factors as a result of this. So things like reduced carbon emissions because there's less driving, there's less flying, less use of, of transportation in general. And then uh, there are also some legal implications. We, we've heard a lot about, um, or of recent, in recent times, the word force majeure has been spoken about quite often. Um, there could be contract disputes that come about and also regulatory pressures. Um, so I'm just gonna move on now to talk about some of the internal risk factors that companies can be thinking about when they're, they're looking at their enterprise risk management. Um, trying to, I'm, I've grouped them into three groups, so operational risk, insurance risk, and financial risk. Um, but again, this is by no means exhaustive, and it's just giving people ideas of the sort of risks that they can be thinking about when they're trying to evaluate the impact of COVID-19 on their business. So the first is business continuity plans, which, which um, the previous speaker talked about a little already. Most of them are already triggered, but um, what we found that it's probably given the robustness of our business continuity plans a wake-up call. A lot, of con a lot of companies had plans in place to work from alternative locations. And with lockdowns, guess what? You can't get to those locations and people had to scurry very fast and, and uh, change to working from home. Um, so evaluating the robustness of your business continuity plan is something that companies definitely should be thinking about. Um, the other issues that we've seen have started arising. So things like running generators at home during the day, I think people may have not thought about that before because you're always in the office during that time. Um, so that's another thing just to, to keep in mind. The next risk I want to talk about is people risk. So uh, with everybody working remotely, it is very, very important to keep your workforce engaged. So companies are gonna have to take the extra step to try and make sure they're keeping in contact with their employees, keeping them engaged, and that will help uh, um, you know, promote the same, same or similar levels of um, in, uh, engagement and output as we had before. Uh, companies should be reviewing the HR policies for any holes that might, that might be there or any, or, or any unforeseen circumstances and just see that we're covering all our bases in terms of that. Um, one other thing that's come out, comes about from people working remotely is there could be increased instances of fraud. So companies should be looking out for that and, and just try and find ways to monitor that. And another interesting outlook on this is people are now realizing that we actually can work from home. And this could present interesting opportunities for companies, particularly in cities like Lagos that face a huge traffic problem. You know, companies could start thinking about their employee welfare and think about maybe it's possible that employees could work from home one day a week just to ease the traffic flow and, and, and help with the stresses that they, they encounter. So that's something that companies could think about um, to, to the extent that it's possible for them. Another uh, issue I wanted to touch on is the distribution channels. I think companies should be reviewing their distribution channels and their structure um, following COVID-19 because right now there is no physical contact and companies that 
probably relied on um, door to door or visiting businesses um, are going to find that they're going to find this. They're going to find that this is much more difficult because you can't you can't do that. Um, so companies should be researching and looking into more online marketing, interacting more with social media. I think um, more important that something that's really important for primary insurers is for them to review their websites. Uh, have a look at your websites and see if your interface is friendly. Can people interact with it quite seamlessly? Can claims be processed on your website seamlessly? Because really it will be companies that can get this right that will be able to continue to engage their customers and continue to maintain their customer base. Um, on along the same vein is also technology. So uh, 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 interesting thing that we're finding about COVID-19 is if in many cases it has been the the biggest driver for technological improvements in the last month. Uh, companies are finding that things they've been talking about for years and thought they couldn't that couldn't be done have been done in a week or two uh, as a result of COVID-19. Which, is, which can be a good thing. So it's proven quite a few things to companies that they, they can make te technological advances. And um, companies should continue and think, about, think more about things like that, like um, evaluate your processes and think, can we go paperless, for example? Um, that would help with the environment. It could decrease costs, uh, heavy reliance on papers, even for processing claims. Maybe we can get rid of that completely. Um, but on the, on the other side, Obviously, there have been some technological issues trying to maintain connectivity. I'm sure if you speak to IT departments everywhere, they're probably finding this period quite stress because, stressful because it's very difficult to, to service um, the staff while they're in different lo locations. And another big thing that's come up is cyber threats. So there has been a heightened increase of cyber activity. Hackers are making good use of COVID-19. And, you know, they're, they're being quite smart about it. Sometimes you might get an email that's in the guise of information about COVID-19 on how, how, how it you can protect your business and you find that it's actually a hacking email. So uh, cyber threats should be uh, um, thought of and looked into um, by companies. Uh, another operational risk is project risk. Uh, companies should definitely not lose sight of their other projects. I know it's very, everything is about COVID-19 everywhere right now. And um, we shouldn't forget the things like IFRS 17 and IFRS 9 going on. These are huge, huge projects for companies. And I know we did get an extension for IFRS 17, but let's not get lax on this. Um, that extension could could be wiped away in a blink of an eye just because we were just focusing on COVID-19 instead of uh, pushing these other projects a lot. And there could also be other internal initiatives that are going on and companies shouldn't look, lose sight of that. Um, another operational risk I wanted to, to touch on is disruptors. So um, I think uh, both of the speakers already spoke about um, uh, potential uh, technological advances and opportunities that uh, situations like this present. And it is possible that the Uber of insurance could emerge out of this, particularly if it's a company that can address that distribution pro problem. If you can come up with something that's really seamless, interact with customers, interact with the phones that they have in their hands all the time, this could give you a huge advantage. And I think companies that are able to address that will, um, will, will come out stronger. And um, it's also possible, you know, we should think about other things as well. It's possible that a company could emerge that can dispatch drones to assess damage. I know this is something that already happens in the US and in parts of Europe, but it could be something that happens in Africa as well. Um, and I think African countries and African companies, we do have the benefit of seeing what's already out there um, in, in, in nations that are a bit more developed. And we could skip stages in development and, and this could be a, a catalyst for that. Um, so I'll just move now to the financial, no, sorry, the insurance risk. So next slide, please. Um, so the previous speaker has spoken quite a lot about this. So I, I think just in terms of categories that you can think about when look, trying to review your insurance risks. So first of all, it's lines that are directly impacted. So we've talked about event cancellation, health, life insurance, travel insurance. It's supposed to be, it's expected to be quite severely hit in quite in a few of um, the more developed nations. But I think in Africa, it's not necessarily an insurance that's taken up 
quite often. So it, 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 we might not see as many losses there. Um, but yeah, anything to do with the tourism industry and aviation is expected to, 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 to have an impact. But we are seeing that people might think it might be more of an earnings rather than a capital event. So we might see more claims in some of these lines, but it, it, it is expected largely that um, insurers can, um, you know, they, they can account for these, the, these claims uh, with their earnings rather than their capital. And then uh, it's also important to think about the lines that are indirectly impacted. So it isn't just COVID-19, but it's, it's really the associated economic downturn that's probably gonna have the larger impact. Um, in terms of COVID-19, we've, we've already talked about how motor loss ratios could e decrease, but we should also not forget that there are other uh, causes of loss that could increase. So there could be potential property damage with a lot of the buildings that are being left empty for a while. And depending on how situations on the ground change, there could be vandalism, looting. And if those are covered losses in your policies, then you might see that you'll be, you'll be getting um, insurance claims coming from from areas such as that. And of course, there's expected top line reduction, particularly if you if you are, uh, if your main business is in the oil producing economy, governments are gonna shrink their budgets, people are not gonna have as much money. So it's um, something that would have to be, be considered. And then in thinking about these companies, there are a few things that companies need to be careful of. So it's been wide, like there's the business interruption debate, debate that has been going on. Um, people will say, oh no, there's no physical damage from COVID-19, so there shouldn't be any business interruption coverage. But there are other things people are looking at. So denial of access is usually a clause in, in some of these uh, policies, or, or someone can, might be able to successfully argue that COVID-19 represents contamination of their premises. So um, I know that debates have started on this and companies should be wary that they might think they don't, they, they don't have exposure to this, but uh, they could end up finding that they have to, to, to cover it because governments can intervene even if, even if it's ex excluded and mandate that things get paid. And um, on, you know, uh, a side effect of that is that could also impact investor confidence because it, um, it's showing that there isn't contract certainty in insurance if governments are allowed to do that. So something definitely to think about because there are reasons for exclusions and policies. They can't be priced. They, these exclusions would not have been priced into your premiums. So you should think about how that's going to impact your business and whether you can um, you you can cover these claims. And on on the subject of covering claims. I think companies are definitely going to see a lot more ex gratia payments being made. The reinsurers and insurers alike may find that they have to uh, pay more of these claims to manage the reputational risk that comes out, even though there are lots of exclusions and they are clear, um, just because of the economic environment and, and the fact that you might have long-standing customers, you might find that you, the, that you might be making these additional payments um, just to manage your re reputational risk. And on, on, on that topic, there's also corporate social responsibility. So I know um, quite a few companies have already stepped up and companies are stepping up. Um, but for those that might not have budgets for this, you might find that you're being looked at by governments and your customers to step up. So it might be important to make sure that you are considering this um, uh, as a possibility. And it um, COVID-19 also gives the opportunity to, to consider other policy attributes um, so other policy attributes. So things like pro policy coverage extensions that you might have or payment holidays that might be baked in some of your, your policies. People might have not used them before, but they, they might be taking advantage of them. And if you don't offer those, it might be a chance for you to offer some of these to your customers. They might look at it more favorably and, and it might um, encourage um, uh, customer loyalty. And and actually, on the subject of customer loyalty, um, some, if some companies are of the, the um, opinion that COVID-19 may actually improve their retention rate, ratios because customers will be too lazy to, to shop around and they'll just renew their policies. I mean, that, it is a thing that could happen, but we shouldn't become complacent in that. You know, we've mentioned before that if a disruptor comes, maybe they'd, they'd be taking, taking away your, your um, client base. So I think... Um, that's important to, to, to note. And if we just move on to uh, financial risks. 
Oh, and actually there's one more thing that I wanted to mention. Um, COVID-19 could present other opportunities for you to add like other, other attributes to your policies. So for example, with motor insurance, um, right now there are a lot of cars sitting idle in homes and people might be thinking, oh no, um, this insurance policy is a bit useless, I'm paying for it, what am I, what am I doing? But um, um, if you are able to successfully uh, tailor your insurance policies and successfully price them and rework them um, such that it reflects actual usage of the policy, that could be something that's looked at favorably by uh, customers as well. I mean, one thing the Carter ban that happened recently in Lagos showed us is that there are a lot of cars that are sitting at home not being used. Um, so you might be able to increase your customer base if you're able to, to design such a policy. Um, so moving on to financial risks, there is definitely going to be stress on uh, balance sheets. Uh, companies are going to be to, to, be, to find that that is going to be um, an issue and they should definitely be reviewing their, their financials for this, looking at their assets and investments. The economic downturn recession has, has been reefing, wreaking havoc on financial markets and companies should sit down and ask themselves, how risky are their investments? Do you need to restructure, restructure to um, something that's a bit lower risk? Um, it's something that you should be considering. Also your liquidity, you'll find that payments are coming in slower or not at all. Um, so cash might not be flowing in as before, and this could leave some companies cash trapped. Um, so definitely sit down and have a think I, of whether or not you're liquid enough to pay your claims, review your ALM robustness and see how, see where you lie because liquidity will become an issue um, in the next few months. And solvency, uh, companies should sit down and look at the, the amount of capital that they have and perform stress and scenario testing on it. Um, ask themselves, ask yourselves really, do you have what it takes to survive? I mean, in terms of scenario tests, it might be, people might think it's a bit early to come up with relevant ones, but it is worth a try. And it is worth looking at reverse stress tests um, so companies can think about scenarios that would cause them to be insolvent or cause their business uh, business model to, to, to not work anymore. So reverse stress test is probably going to be a good idea. And for reinsurers, being able to, to do these stress tests and show to your, your rating agencies that you've thought through them will probably help in those discussions as well. Companies might find that they are some inhibitors to what they're trying to do, could be exacerbated by some um, regulators trying to increase their minimum capital requirements. I know this has already been happening in Nigeria and um, companies may find that they're under stress. So this could, we could find that there are more mergers and, op and acquisitions in the market. Uh, depending on which side of the coin that you, you fall, it could be an opportunity for you or, or not. But, but I think companies definitely have to sit down and look at their fin financials and really think through um, how COVID-19 is going to affect their, their um, their financials and whether or not they'll be able to to manage through it and then lastly um just on the last slide i just wanted as the previous um um as the previous speaker also talked about with risk comes opportunity so i did mention that um companies that are are going to be able to capitalize it on this companies that are flexible companies that are going to be able to see the opportunities um work on technological improvements and, and get to the customers are companies that are gonna come out stronger. So I think um, definitely take time to review the opportunities, try and see what you can seize and um, don't re re neglect the, next of your, the rest of your business because COVID-19 is gonna go away at some point and you do wanna um, make sure that you can continue and, and come out as a stronger company. And that's all for me, thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And actually, I particularly um, like to recap on the importance of stress testing and doing the reverse stress testing at this moment. I don't think it's too early. I think it's the right time for us to uh, start considering all the assumptions now and um, just to get also part of good governance to be able to inform the board, the senior management team of potential. I mean, there, there'll be both opportunities and threats from this. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take the final presentation and then we'll go to some questions. So we have some questions already. And um, what I'll be doing, I'll, I'm sending the question to the, to the speakers to start considering to give us some feedback and then we'll be able to uh, take everything at, at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, I'll be taking Bola's presentation. Just a minute, I'm, I'm pulling it up. And I just roll it as well. Well, are you ready? Oh, yes. Thank you. Fantastic. I'll just pull your presentation up now. And then. Okay, go for it. Good day, everyone. And uh, I hope we are all uh, at this time informed and we are trying to keep safe uh, from this pandemic uh, uh, situation that we find ourselves. I'll be considering um, a topical issue here, the, pot the potential implications for insurance claims. The next slide. Okay, these are my, the content uh, of my presentation. And then you have uh, the first one to be the introduction and I'll be taking them after the order. My colleague had already mentioned a lot of implications to uh, the insured, both economical, social, political, and technological. So I will just be dwelling on the reinsurance aspect. Um, COVID-19 related claims are on the increase and insureds are uh, in their interpretation that there is coverage. However, when a claims payment will depend, a claims payment will depend on if policy is covered by insurance, the type of coverage and the policy terms and condition, which may have uh, exclusions that limit the payout for pandemic or epidemic related losses. So if you look at uh, the, the diagram that I have below here, um, we are just discovering this pandemic uh, affecting us both in our normal life and in our social life and in our, and in our business life. So you will discover, we are discovering COVID-19 now and it's developing whether this will result into what is claim, what is claimable uh, from the insurers or the insurance alike will have to look at the policy document. However, we are still discovering and developing. So to this end, uh, we can't say we are at the post loss situation because to actually put the policy to test is whether COVID-19 is covered by the insurer. Please the next slide. Okay, these are the, police, these are the potential uh, claims that arise from a reinsurance contract. You, are, you can actually pick loss from your quarterly returns in terms of uh, a treaty contract, or you have a facultative business, or you are picking a large loss. Um, a COVID-19 situation is not a risk that affects individual, it's affecting the global um, environment. And so you could uh, have losses arising from COVID-19 to be aggregated in, as a single loss. How could you aggregate as a single loss catastrophe occurrence for insurance purpose? And if so, across other lines as well, mm -hmm. for which COVID-19 may be underlining costs of loss, but no specific event trigger cover. The next slide. What we're saying here is that the concern for reinsurance um, arising from claim, I mean, uh, a claim that is admissive is um, the risk of fluctuation accumulation 
for fluctuation in result over a period of time. Uh, for instance, one year, and for accumulation, for instance, in life policies, it may be easier to establish that a disease is a direct cause of loss and the unifying concept. You will have at this point, this is not related to COVID-19, but the impact that you will be having is that the long outstanding claims may be commuted by the concerns because there is, um, there is a seizure in, in terms of economic activities. And then you have uh, a situation where there is no uh, movement in terms, in terms of commercial activities and people are uh, they're short of cash. And then so if you, there, are, there will be a situation where the claims department will be picking claims not relating to COVID-19 in this time, but also uh, having to commit their claims during this period. You, must, you may also have, no, it's still the, the, the slide. You may also have a situation where you have, although this is not binding and it's gradual, maybe considered um, for a COVID-19, but this is ne it's not binding on the policy because the actual policy depends on uh, the claims, uh, the, the claims payable is actually dependent on policies, terms and conditions. All right, you will have um, a situation, but we don't have it right now. Uh, the pace and the volume of COVID-19 in intimated claims is likely to compromise the, the scrutiny of claims handler if COVID-19 is insurable. And there may be immense pressure for claims to be settled in a short period of time due to precarious cash flow and solvency position of many insureds and indeed uh, commercial lines. We can go on. So for instance, you will have um, uh, for property and casualty policies could be triggered by um, uh, the virus. It will include the type of claim that may start to emerge from assembly line workers, call centers, hotel staffs, more especially if claims feel directly linked to the virus can be shown or proven. Again, this will have to depend on the policy terms and condition. The next slide. No, the previous one. Now for companies that rely significantly on third party providers for critical components of or service, which likely um, consider making claims to recoup losses as a result of interruption. For property risk, no material damage as such, but Consequential loss of rent are covered if material damage can be proven. The next slide. Now, what we're saying is uh, for property risk, you will have this clause in a property risk which uh, addresses the uh, failure or denial to gain access. Loss of, loss of egress or ingress. Now, now you have this clause in your, in your policy, civil authority denies or closes access to business or advises which uh, very little option to uh, such societal practice. The element of coverage in this instance is that is, that, is the ingress or egress from insured property is prevented by a covered peril, whether disease or, or pandemics, this again, the quality holding will address it. What we what we have at the moment does not uh, the policies that we have at the moment does not uh, provide uh, cover for pandemics and uh, anything that has a direct result therefrom. The wordings and context of these specific wordings will need to be thoroughly appreciated prior to any claims being considered as indemnifiable. These extensions are also limited. So we go back to our, to our policies and then you will realize that um, COVID-19 is not specifically uh, covering uh, uh, failure or denial to gain access. The next slide. Next slide, please. 
so you will have impacts, possible impacts of COVID-19 on various classes. The wordings of a contract would need to be carefully perused to see if physical damage needs to apply here or simply denial of assets from civil authority. The denial of assets is intended to relate to the location of the property within a radius for a specific localized event as opposed to a global pandemic and whether potential BI claims prevails as well. So what we're saying is denial of assets has to be related to the location in which that property operates and within the radius uh, that is mentioned in the contract. The next slide. Given indemnity periods, when is the loss triggered? Insurers will, have, will need to produce the various contingency extension covers in their contract. The key issue here is whether there is intent to consider for some liability transfer without a physical trans triggering of a material damage event. Then for BI in some areas, retail sales are actually on high demand. For now, you will realize that food items and those um, in the business of delivering domestic stuff to homes, their sales are on the high, while other sectors are recording uh, low revenue. So stock inventory are actually running out and there's no way to replace them um, at the moment. Again, BI exposure. The actual wording of the contract will give rise to a claim. And let me just make a mention of this, is that uh, pandemic is, uh, there's no reference to pandemic situation when BI exposures are considered. The next slide. No, before that. Again, on the engineering side, the material is nil material damage expected. Abandonment of site, but usually three months or longer per above. Loss of entrance or exit, and then potential impact on delaying startup. No physical damage. So highly unlikely since the underlying contractors or risk must respond first. Again, actual wording requires full perusal. Next slide. For liability contracts, there are no policies typically include limitation on coverage for ailment, illness, illnesses and bodily injury. These limitations may be broadly Worded. And so, employers' liability, professional negligence, and also pollution and contamination. Clean up operations, but this again relates to what emanates from property accounts insured. Next slide. Now, for oil and gas, operation, operators' extra expenses, drilling rigs, and platform activities, loss of production income coverage under a typical a energy package insurance, which is typically provided if there is a direct physical loss, such as fire, flood, or earthquake. Again, there's no mention of coronavirus. The policy may require that a loss, that a loss is de designated. Next slide. And so you can see, COVID-19, a direct physical loss may not be read readily apparent at this situation that could trigger a physical loss an oil field upstream environment or facility becomes contaminated and therefore unusable due to COVID-19. How do we envisage physical losses emanating? Loss of income. Loss of production income coverage if a supplier suffers shutdown due to COVID-19. But this will require close examination of the policies to see if this may be applicable without any underlying fiscal damage cover experienced. And then two, that unlikely event, to what extent this limit of liability. The next slide. And this is where uh, the major um, 
contract of uh, uh, exclusion in, in our policies, force majeure. Uh, provisions are quite significant in upstream offshore contracts and contracted oil risk. Welcome policies. Um, the majority of international business agreements include force majeure clauses in their provisions. However, there's no universal definition of force majeure as such or of the specific circumstances which give rise to it since different jurisdictions adopt different approaches. COVID-19 presents common grounds that would trigger a force majeure clause, usually as associated with the likes of outbreak of war, perpetration of a crime, rioting, and striking as well as act of God, such as raft of natural disasters, including hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunami, flooding, and earthquake. These are definitely and not uh, COVID-19. For our Greek policies, in view of the current situation, most insurance will in all likelihood more specifically not cover agric losses due to lack of planting and late planting season. Crop damages, post-harvest losses as a result of unattended farms resulting from a country's lockdown and, and quarantine. It is also expected for lockdown to apply to the extent that farmers are unable to physically visit their farms. You will know that most farmers are usually residing very closer to the farm and their proximity is not, uh, is not far from the, from the farming. Next slide. So you will have an agric policy that provides cover for named perils and those perils are they are well spelt in the contract. Um, is the prevailing COVID-19 covered is highly debatable and unlikely. They are not uh, named in the contract. These apply as well for delayed harvest, post-harvest losses, management and consequential losses. Market views are that it is not to be expected for situations for situation to be a substantial accumulation threat. The next one. For marine contract, the nature of goods, mostly perishable goods, um, country of origin, discharge because of measures taken by different countries like quarantine slash clap down ETC. In view of the current situation, many insurance will not cover duty and increased values. Uh, further, Cover will not be extended to cover demorages and any cost arising out of closure of ports and any quarantine cost arising out of COVID-19. Insurance also wished not to cover perishables for now taking due cognizance of measures taken by different countries in the quarantine and clampdown. The next one. That's for Marie. No, 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 no. And for bonds, for bonds and construction, the timeline of completion may be impacted by delaying startup, which may depend, which may, depending on the wording, force major provision of the policy, lead to potential claims intimation. But will it be reasonable to call on a bond on the basis of contractors' non-performance arising out of pandemic? Businesses, you note that businesses seek to buy cancellation insurance for events around the world will clearly be unable to get cover for coronavirus outbreak. This is the principle of insurance, not to cover the foreseeable. Industry sources indicate on event insurance Insurance have begun to exclude the pandemic from these policies. Next slide. Now we have the prevailing regulation and regulatory environment and association. Uh, we shall be considering Nigeria and Ghana. And these are um, the effect of uh, COVID-19 on insurance operations regarding approval in principle. Uh, uh, the commission has given a palliative measures 
in ensuring adequate insurance cover now permits lead insurer to ensure excess of their risk off offshore, you will realize that before this, you have to present your approval in principle before you even um, uh, offshore your risk. So, but uh, the palliative given by the regulator is you can't do that and submit your documents uh, to the commission thereafter uh, the availability of local content capacity. The next slide. In NIA also uh, has taken the initiative to arrange a special life insurance for health personnel and allied professionals who are attending to victims of COVID-19. Uh, the benefits are a 1 million Naira for permanent disability and debt. And the premium uh, for free life cover will be paid by insurers. Adding the cover uh, will be provided by life on the right side. Next slide. In a similar development in Ghana, uh, the Ghana Ministry of Health under the government of Ghana have uh, provided the families of frontline staff involved in response to COVID-19 uh, to insure them for 350 million Ghana city per life. Next slide. Now, continental response to COVID-19. This draft subjectivity for the market consideration as we try to help maintain an environment that continues to treat clients, customers fairly, not create misconceptions, and to ensure better understanding of the scopes of cover being granted on the basis of known an unfolding pandemic. For Marine, uh, no cover for duty and increased value going forward. In addition, cover will not be extended to cover demorages and any cost arising out of closure of ports or any quarantine cost arising out of COVID-19. And for properties, no cover for infectious or contagious diseases or authority. And then non-physical damage, interruption, declination, and loss of attraction or related consequential loss extensions. And for DNO, excluding the allegation of a wrongful act, including but not limited to error, the statement acts will mention negligence, breach of duty by the directors and officers of the company pertaining to failure to perform duties as they relate to restrictions on operations, communication to stakeholders, and any other actions directly or indirectly caused by resulting or attributable to connection with or caused by stemming, stemming from uh, or in relation to the pandemic disease, uh, COVID-19. In conclusion, the present situation now warrants uh, that the pace and then the financial pressure arising out of COVID-19 claims will only continue to increase and will put existing claims handling procedures for insurance and reinsurance on that stream. Reinsurance and insurance are to remain vigilant and ensure that all within the supply chain continue to meet their obligations under their policies despite exceptional circumstances. Furthermore, effective and timely communication is more important than ever. Reinsurance may also need to consider whether their programs should be redesigned in response to increased exposure to pandemics in the future. Risk and opportunities and potential, like my other uh, colleagues have said, for new pandemic cover, will there be opportunities? Because in the real sense, when you are trying to provide cover for an emerging risk, you'll need to consider a lot of factors. Uh, part of it is, is the cost of claim. And then you have to factor in other loadings and then whether there will be um, additional expenses in terms of uh, um, the margin for profits. So before you start to add uh, other costs. For, 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 for pandemic, it's global and is seen as a catastrophe. So there had there to be uh, uh, a catastrophe modeling uh, to, to me uh, as a suggestion. 
um, to be able to write a pandemic of this nature in conclusion. And um, that's the end of the slide. And uh, be informed, be prepared, and be safe. I now welcome questions from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is, uh, I must say that uh, subject to availability of the speakers, we, we might have to run this again, but I will follow up sessions because there, there, there are lots of people who are unable to join the call and it's been this is going to be a very very big conversation going on so there are a couple of questions already i've given the speakers some questions already while we're waiting for them uh, for the rest if you have any other question <clears throat> if you just raise your hand in the member participation or you kind of uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let the speaker address the few questions i've emailed to them or sent to them by text first and then we can take one or two other questions before we close. Uh, thank you very much. Should I, should I start? Adebola, are you there? Are you, are you still online? Okay, Yvonne, I'll, I'll take you then. The one or two questions I've sent to you, I text you. Would you like to address those first before I pick the rest, please? Okay, sure. I think the first question uh, from Simon Mensa. The question was um, on distribution channels and technology, what will be the likely effect on equity based on the cost of technology and digitization and its effect on investment post COVID-19 lockdown as they might be reduced consumer expenditure based on job losses and unemployment rate increase which would affect the average individual's ability to purchase insurance? That's quite a loaded question. Um, um, just in terms of the effect on equity, so that's actually uh, something that's diff very difficult to estimate because it will depend on your business structure, it will depend on what you're investing in, it will depend on the sort of technology you're investing in as well. So I think that would very much vary by company and what their strategy is. Um, so, I'll move on to the se second part of the question, just in terms of um, reduced consumer demand because of job losses, et cetera. Now, something we should remember is that insurance penetration in many African countries is very, very low. I mean, we're talking about 3%, 2%. So um, that means that 97% of the population is still not covered. So even with reductions in consumer demand, there's still a huge population that hasn't been reached to begin with. Now, so it just depends on the sort of strategy that a company can come up with. You could just be targeting the targeting more wealthy people and trying to just uh, sell insurance to them. Or you could find a way to try and target more people and, and, and show to them that actually insurance is useful to you, even in situations like this, because it gives you um, a cushion to fall back on. So it, it's about trying to first prove um, the usefulness of insurance and then also coming up with a suitable strategy to um, reach the remaining people that don't have insurance as well. I think particularly in Africa, this is something, this is something that's, that's very specific to Africa. If we're in a different uh, uh, country that has huge, a large insurance penetration, I think that that would be a very, um, a, a topical question for them because they they definitely are looking at increased demand f from everywhere and they, they can't increase insurance penetration because it's saturated already. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, I guess going to the second question that was brought up is on the issue of denial of access under BI policies, does in, is insurance meant to cover societal related risk, which is the responsibility of the government? Um, so it's no insurance is not meant to, and I think I've seen a few discussions that we're not meant to, um, but um, the thing is you could find that you might have to, because first of all, and we have actually seen that some governments have mandated coverage of COVID-19. So we can't put it past um, uh, governments to do that. It's, it's already been done. And then 
secondly, we mentioned ex gratia payments. So companies may find that they have to be making the payments anyway to manage their reputational risk, um, even if they're not supposed to be paying it. But on the flip side, as I mentioned, contract certainty, you, you might find that investors might be looking looking down on, on th looking, might not be looking at this favorably. So it, 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 uh, companies have to weigh the pluses and minuses of that. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, Bola, do you want to address what the first question to you as well, if you don't mind? Thank you very much, Conrad. Uh, sorry, thank you very much, Jachi. I, yeah, in my response to uh, the denial of access, um, there's clearly, you know, the contract uh, uh, says it will cover uh, BI as a result of denial of access. If you check your policy, what didn't you realize? Um, the provisions on denial of access, uh, which have to be, if I make reference to my slide, uh, which is um, just one minute, um, there is a specific body to denial of access, which ultimately did not make mention of a pandemic situation. Okay, so, and from this uh, point of view, denial of access, when you're addressing a claim on the IBI uh, for a COVID-19 related claims, which seems not to be uh, covered by the contract. And so um, uh, for it uh, to be actually covered, there will be clear wording that will address that. Uh, Again, denial of access is saying uh, the authority, because you would, you would realize that some sub, uh, supply retail uh, are actually having an increase in their, in their operations. You will agree with me that they are, especially the food vendors and the rest. And so even though there is denial of access, it seems to have increase in stock and they are, you know, the commercial activity is still going on. Thank you very much. Um, this, uh, because other sectors were stopped from uh, doing that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Babalala Williams, I'll take your question first. Hello, Babalala, are you there? Yes, I'm with you. Okay. Uh, my own question is based on this uh, edge water payment. Looking at the uh, Pandemic and this COVID-19 is classified as a fundamental risk with the widespread is generally paid. So to what level can an insurance company pay uh, a data uh, claim? To what level, if at all it could be entertained, to what level can they pay a, uh, a claim on a data? Thank you. Um, I'll take, uh, maybe I'll take, um, Oh yeah, all as well, and then we'll answer the two together. So to what level should the company go to pay extra extra gasha? Um Oluashem, Isaac. Uh, okay. Um who is going to go first, Bola or Ivan? Okay, I, I'll go. As gratuitous payment is not necessarily uh, admittance of liability. And so when you are considering a claim under a commercial consideration, uh, 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 the reinsured uh, with the insurance company uh, would, uh, there is certain exclusion that would have operated and will make the claim not admissive. So the next step is you are looking at commercial consideration in terms of uh, ensuring you maintain a healthy relationship with your clients. And so the Esgrasha payment will now be uh, what the reinsurer would uh, can afford to actually support the client in terms of that. But again, this is uh, a not legal, uh, it's not a legal requirement. Thank you. I think that covers it well. 
Um, Oluwashen, do you want to ask a question? Okay. I think what we're going to do there, all the other questions that we have, because of time, we have only four minutes, one hour. Like, I wouldn't want to keep you all too long. This is a very, very um, topical issue and there are lots of people um, with lots of questions. So we'll put all the questions together. We're going to put a Q&A together uh, on our website, but also I'm going to ensure that perhaps we'll look for another day if um, I can get the consent of all the speakers to run another session like this again um, sometime next week, if, if it's possible. If not, we'll put all the questions on our website for everybody to, uh, and I'll reach out to all the speakers as well and put our own views there. I want to thank you all for joining today. Um, this is just the beginning of a journey, especially for this particular uh, um, uh, experience that we're all going through. I want to say this also, as my colleagues already mentioned earlier on, please, please, please don't take it for granted. Stay safe. It's not about how old or how fit you are. And, and it has no barrier to your status or anything you do. So please take precautions, protect your families, and let's all pray together. I hope that this tomorrow will be over soon. There are more um, webinars we're running next week on risk perception. The social media is just bombarded with all kind of uh, fake news. How do you protect yourself? How do you protect your organization from all these kind of things? We'll be coming with, uh, with, to, with that sometime next week as well. And just watch out. Please like, go on our LinkedIn page or social media page on our website for more information. We have loads and lots of webinars just to help organizations, individuals to understand how to weather through this uncertain period. And that's what we do best to make sure we help you to manage risk when in the midst of crisis. But most of also finally, for those who have uh, would like to put in for a risk award, please I would encourage you to do that, nigerianriskaward.com. So please join me to say thank you to all the speakers. I wish we can do a round Sorry. of applause together. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hello, Jacob. I just want to add uh, to thank your you. final remark. Well, I appreciate you. And, okay. and uh, I just want to add to your final remark is uh, if you have questions relating to these papers, you can channel them through uh, Conrad Clark. And you surely get a response to that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you also. Uh, please, apologize, please help us to apologize to all your colleagues that couldn't get on this call. I think the the the, the fast was able to take only the first hundred, but we'll try and see if we can do it again. Thank you very much. Have a good Easter. Have a safe weekend, and please no, no, stay no. safe with your family. Uh, I want to appreciate you. We presented one paper for discussion, but these people. I hope we are going well for this thing. Yes. The other one we do eh, is so interesting. Nobody will even want to leave because you see.
Aki, what is so? What do you call That is your sleep. Are you sleeping? Huh? I'm not sleeping. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look at 